Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. I have discussed the moon landings on previous shows and this subject can be a very hot potato. Whatever your opinion is on whether in 1969 Neil Armstrong walked on the lunar surface or not, I think you will be very interested to see the evidence and analysis put forward in today's show. In fact, I will go as far as to say if you are currently on the fence, today's show will probably get you off the fence. And I will also say that if you believe Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, you are going to have doubts about that belief after today's show. To help me delve into some more moon mission evidence, I'd like to welcome back onto the show, Andrew Johnson. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for inviting me back, Richard. I hope I'm not you know, wearying too many viewers with my uh, repeated appearances. <laughs> it's very appropriate dress code, Andrew. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Now, um, what we're going to present first is uh, some analysis from Peter Hyatt. And um, viewers may remember, you can follow the link on the screen here, that uh, I went over to the States to interview uh, statement analyst Peter Hyatt, who is an expert in analysing language and what people say in discussion and analysing whether they are telling the truth or not. And... Um, 99% of the feedback I've had on that interview that I did about the Madeleine McCann case was positive. You do get the odd person saying, well, this is not a recognised science, so we can't read anything into it. So what I say is, listen to what the guy's saying about his analysis of, of, of that person's sentences and, how, and, and what in his conclusions, and come to your own conclusion. You don't have to believe it, uh, but I personally think he's right most of the time on the conclusions he comes to after he analyzes people's speech. I watched the program you did uh, with Peter Hyatt and um, I think it was just uh, to see him coming to very similar conclusions f you know, from his analysis of that interview which probably took him, I don't know, four, five, six hours and he put it on his blog and you'd done all that research in Portugal and met all those people and spoke to all those people. For th those to be so similar, you know, I think that shows you the, the extreme value of the technique that Peter Hyatt's developed. Mm -hmm. All right, and um, what, what, what I found quite funny is that a few people have emailed me saying, why did you ask Peter Hyatt about Apollo at the end of the Madeline interview? That's really going to discredit your Madeline research. Mm. <laughs> well, the truth is the truth, folks. Mm. And if Peter Hyatt is getting closer to the truth by analysing an interview uh, made by a, a, an employee of the US government... He's analysing the words of an employee of the US government, i.e. Neil Armstrong. Why should that discredit anything? The yeah. truth is the truth. He's using the same technique, you know, on an interview where a question and answer session, the subject matter is surely less important. Yeah, exactly. It affects the human race in the ways that the Madeleine McCann case doesn't. Um, we're, to we're talking about technology, yeah, technological yeah, yeah, cover-ups. Yeah. I chose a seven minute long Neil Armstrong interview and I sent it to Peter Hyatt uh, and I'm, I presented it in my lecture earlier this year. So I'm going to show you, a, I think it's about 20 odd minutes long. Now, if you've seen the uh, Peter Hyatt video of his, um, with the Madeleine McCann subject. Have you got a, a rough figure as to how many cases you've looked at? Um, hundreds. Techniques used to discern deception but also content analysis. So it goes well beyond just saying if someone is lying or not, what are they lying about, why are they lying? They are to sit down comfortably, choose their own words, they're given bottled water in a comfortable setting, there is no threats, there is no uh, coercion. Please tell us in your own words what happened. And the person says, well, where do I begin? Wherever you feel comfortable beginning. So we don't introduce any language to them or any words. Mm. Person writes out what happened. If we are, then take that statement and properly analyze it in a scientific method, meaning we expect the same results, putting in the same data repeatedly, the investigator can now know this person did it, when he did it, how he did it, why he did it. Well, tell us what happened and what happened next. Those are the two most powerful questions that we have. What happened? What happened next? Mm -hmm. It allows them to choose whatever they want to choose, and, and this is an important point. The average person has an, a vocabulary of about 20,000 words. When you ask someone what happened, they must go into that vocabulary, 
decide what words to use out of the 20,000, where to order them, what verb tenses to use, what pronouns to use, where to place each word next to each other to communicate in less than a microsecond of time. That is a process that when disrupted by deception, we catch. When someone uses an unnecessary word, unnecessary phrase, unnecessary detail, we deem it as doubly important. And when you ask them what happened, they must go into their memory. And when experiential memory speaks, it is very smooth and it goes in chronological order. A lie will disrupt that. And that causes internal stress. So people say, well, you know, sociopaths don't feel stressed when they're, when they're lying. That's not true. They feel very stressed when they're lying because they don't want to be caught. So to disrupt that process is very stressful. And those that are really good at lying will use a substitute of words. So one of the things they'll do, instead of saying, I did not use performance-enhancing drugs, they say, I never used performance-enhancing drugs. I would never. Uh, and what they're doing is they're actually distancing themselves from an actual denial. And what about qualifying words which change or weaken a statement? Tell us about that. Sure. Um, it can be used appropriately. It can be used inappropriately. If I said to you, I locked my keys in the car, you can be confident that I know where my keys are. They're locked in the car. If I said to you, I think I locked my keys in the car, that's called a weak assertion because I'm not certain if they're there. I did not shoot that man is very different from saying, I don't think I shot the man. So I selected a seven minute long Neil Armstrong interview from 1970, transcribed it, and I've asked Peter to analyze it, which he's done. Cost me uh, $275 for the analysis. So that's what you've paid for essentially by coming here. So, um, so this interview aired on the sky at night on the 18th of November 1970, which is less than a year and a half after the moon landings. So everything should be pretty clear in Neil Armstrong's mind. So what you're going to see here is a very short clip of the interview, followed by Pit Hyatt's analysis, then another clip, and then more analysis. So although it's only a seven minute long interview, it'll probably take me 20, 25 minutes to get through the analysis. So here goes. Mr. Armstrong. I do realize that when you were on the moon, you had very little time for gazing upwards. But could you tell us something about what the sky actually looks like from the moon, the sun, the earth, the stars, if any, and so on? The sky is uh, deep black uh, when viewed from the moon, as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the earth and the moon. We note erm and er as pauses in the answer and seek to determine if this is a habit of speech or if it is a signal that the subject needs more time to consider his answer. That he began with the sky is deep black indicates a willingness to answer the question directly. This is a somewhat lengthy answer which begins with two pauses for thought. The subject is presupposed to have been on the moon, something of great rarity at the time of this interview. The subject is intelligent and well trained. The expectation is that he will, according to the wording of the question, report what he himself saw. In any singular or exclusive event, there is an expectation of heightened importance, and when we speak from experiential memory, the structure of the sentence is reliable. Expected, given the unique experience of being on the moon, we first note that the subject does not begin his answer with the pronoun I. In analysis, this reduces reliability. Given the context of unique experience, the pronoun I would have shown the psychological strength of experiential memory. Its absence is noted. Even with influence from the interviewer, the expectation is the experiential use of I saw in some part of the answer. Next, we note the use of passive voice with when viewed from the moon. Passive voice removes the subject himself personally from the statement. The use of passivity is found in concealing identity and or responsibility in statements. For example, the gun went off is passive voice. If the subject was in a crowd and did not know who fired the gun, this would be appropriate. Here, the subject is describing a universal viewing and avoiding the singular experience that is expected. Next, when viewed from a uh, cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the Moon. This is similar to the universal pronoun you that is used to describe a common experience. This leads to a question. 
Is viewing the space between the Earth and the Moon a common experience that listeners would readily relate to? The, uh, the Earth is the only visible object other than the Sun that can be seen, although there have been some reports of seeing planets. This is his second sentence after reporting in both passive and universal language. He tells us in general terms what you, universal unnamed, can know, similar to what would be reported in a textbook. Please note the inclusion of some reports. He has thus far avoided giving us personal experience that is highly expected in such an event. This is an indication of avoidance of the response. There is no linguistic connection here between the subject and experiential language at this point. The rule of the negative. Truthful people tell us what they saw, heard, and experienced. When one tells us what they did not see, a la part one, or hear or experience, the analyst recognizes that this sentence increases in importance. I myself did not see planets from the surface, but I suspect they might uh, be visible. Here we not only have the rule of the negative, but we have the unnecessary addition of the word myself. Since he experienced something highly unique, not only does he report what he did not see, but he feels it necessary to input himself into the sentence where no such imputation should be needed. Who else would be answering this question, or not seeing what he did not see? He offers a weak assertion, I suspect they might be visible, appropriately matching might with suspect. Being that he has thus far not told us what he has seen, it is interesting to note the inclusion of the word suspect. What other word might he have chosen? I think they might be visible would be an appropriately weak assertion where one lacks certainty. The word think is the most commonly chosen. Therefore, we note the use of suspect or suspicion within his vocabulary in context of his answer. We continue to wait to hear him tell us what he saw. The Earth is quite beautiful from space uh, and from the moon. It looks quite small and quite remote, but uh, it's very blue and covered with... Uh, white lace and of the clouds and the continents are clearly seen although they have very little color from that distance okay this is just an aside from myself he said that from the moon the earth looks very small and remote now the earth is four times the diameter of the moon and we're all used to seeing the moon in the sky and how big it is so if you were to see something that big in the sky would you call it small and remote here we have more sensory description, but we have not uh, heard him tell us what he himself saw. The description is strong, but is not yet connected to the subject. This could come from him, or it could come from a book, or another's opinion. With such a stupendous history-making event, we expect to hear up-close personal language. Thus far, we have not. What about the sun? Do you see any trace of the corona? No, the uh, glare from the sun on the helmet visor was too difficult to pick out the corona. Here he says no, which answers the question, but then continues to avoid personal linguistic connection, such as, no, the glare of the sun on my helmet visor was too difficult for me to pick out the corona. This would have been a statement of personal connection, which he has not yet made. Remember, he was asked, did you, with the focus upon himself. He should answer for himself. The only time we could see the corona was during an eclipse of the sun from the moon, that is when we were flying through the moon's shadow and could observe the, the, uh, the solar corona peeking out from behind the moon. Even if he said the only time I could see was when we were flying, which would fulfill the personal impactful event on self while sharing we when flying. Stronger is what I saw rather than we. The pronoun we could be produced if he and at least one other discuss this specific topic. Still, given the nature of a most unique and overwhelming event, the expectation remains. He should be using I and past tense verbs in correlation with sensory description. Please consider that given the spectacular and unique privilege of what he experienced, the pronoun me may be used in a desire not to claim any glory or credit for himself. This may be an indication of team over individual. Even with this accepted, we continue to expect him to, at some point, tell us what he experienced. Thus far, he has not. When the pronoun we is used consistently, we look for the first emergence of the pronoun I and conclude that the sentence containing it is very important. 
Looking at the photographs that you brought back, uh, the coloured photographs of the moon's surface, it seems that the colour of the surface actually varies according to the angle from which you see it. Is this so? Does it, uh, does it do this? Yes, it certainly does. So. The wording is appropriate given the structure of the question. Does it do this? Answered by, it does. We do note the inclusion of certainly as an unnecessary emphasis. Uh, it's a characteristic that we observe first while uh, traveling around the moon in orbit. You can see that at the terminator. Rather than saying we saw and the stronger I saw, he only tells us what they could see at this point. What causes this weak assertion? Why does this historical and spectacularly unique event not yet produce a personal response from the subject? At the, uh, the, the boundary between the black part of the moon and the lighted part of the moon, uh, it was as if you were looking at a television set with the contrast turned uh, to uh, full contrast. Here he uses the universal you, second person, that is more likely used in, a, in commonly experienced issues, such as a television set contrast. Still, however, the lack of personal connection linguistically raises the question of personal impact upon the subject. What follows next is distancing language. Very black and very white. Uh, as you moved uh, further into the light, there were more and more shades of gray. But as you moved further, such that the sun was higher above the horizon, you actually start to see the uh, tans and browns appear, although uh, at a very low level. This is distancing language. You, but the event described is specific to him and exclusively astronauts. There is nothing universal about the movement described. Whereas the listener can be referred to with the use of a television, the same cannot be said of space travel. Description is in the language, but there is no justification for the distancing use of the pronoun you in a very highly specialized and dramatic personal experience. Similarly, on the surface of the moon, the same characteristic is evident. Here, there is no pronoun I and no past tense verb. The pronoun I used with a past tense verb is a signal of linguistic commitment. Here, no use of I is also in a sentence where the present tense description is given. You can see uh, browns uh, if the sun is high enough. Apollo 12, for example, landed while the sun was only five degrees above the horizon. So when they arrived, they saw no browns or tans anywhere, only fairly high contrast grays. He refers back to history and reports what is commonly and already known. The interviewer has asked him specifically for himself of his experiences. This general answer may have caused this next interruption. But you did. But, yes, I did. The sun was 11 degrees. And Apollo 12 did also. The next day, when, the, uh, when they arose from their sleeping period and the sun was higher, of course, then the browns were observable to them. We finally have the subject speaking for himself. Unfortunately, it is due to an interruption. When he said, yes, I did, we hold to an expectation that he would now include himself, I, and tell us the sensory descriptions that he holds within personal experiential memory. He does not. He went back to history from his previous answer. Therefore, we do not have the linguistic connection that remains expected. When you were actually walking about on the moon's surface and kicking about a certain amount of dust, did you notice any local color? And also, were you at all subconsciously worried about the possibility of unsafe areas? The interviewer presumes he was walking on the moon. We have yet to hear Mr. Armstrong make this claim or more expectedly, since there is no accusation to the contrary, spoken or unspoken, the linguistic connection. Well, the color is a, is a puzzling phenomenon on the, on the moon, aside from the characteristics that I've already mentioned. Uh, you generally have the impression of being on a desert-like surface with rather light-colored hues. Uh, yet when you look at the material uh, at close range, as if in your hand, you find it's a charcoal gray, in fact, and we were never able to find any things that were very different from that color. Uh, I suspect that as we get more and more samples with future flights, we will see that there is, in fact, some color, but the optical properties on the moon are most peculiar. The theme of distance continues in the description of color. First, he uses the self-reference that I've already mentioned, rather than engage in experiential memory. 
We note the first reference was also not first person statement. Next, we note that he avoids telling us what he himself saw by using second person universal you. You generally have the impression. It is impossible for anyone not there to have this impression, including the interviewer who did not experience it. We prefer he state without qualification what he saw. He does not. When the pronoun I re-emerges, it is a weak assertion. I suspect that as we get, which is another disconnect from the formula of reliability. First person singular past tense with sensory description. When you were actually walking about, did you have any difficulty in distance judging? Because I, I think I heard you say once that uh, near, far things looked quite near. Far things looked quite near. The topic is sight. The one being interviewed is singular. We look for him to answer with I saw in some form. Sensory is very individual. When it is discussed, one may then say the thoughts or perceptions of another. But here he is interviewed alone and is being asked for first person eyewitness account. He does not give a first person singular account. Yes, we had uh, uh, some difficulties in perception of, of, diff of distance. Uh, for example, our television camera, uh, we judged to be from the cockpit of the lunar module only about uh, 50 to uh, 60 feet away, yet we knew that we had pulled it out to the full extension of a 100-foot cable. Uh, similarly, we had difficulty uh, guessing how far the hills out on the horizon might be. Uh, peculiar phenomena is the closeness of the horizon due to the yeah. greater curvature of the moon than we have here on Earth, of course, four times greater, and the fact that uh, it is an irregular surface with uh, crater rims overlying other crater rims. Uh, you, you can't see the real horizon. You're seeing hills that are somewhat closer to you. Uh, there was a large crater uh, which we overflew during our final approach, which was it had hills of the order of 100 feet in height, and uh, we were only 11, 1200 feet west of that hill, and we couldn't see a 100 foot high hill from 11 to 1200 feet away. Perception. He does not speak for himself, including in the realm of perception. This is to address the brain's interpretation of what was seen or experienced. He consistently in the interview tells us what we saw, we thought, we perceived, as well as what you saw, and so on. Although many of these topics were likely discussed, he should still be speaking for himself. This use of we is most unexpected. We must now consider that if he is not deceptive, uh, why does he have a reason to join a crowd even in personal experience and perception? Did you notice any obvious difference between the far side and the near side? As he went around it? I mean, apart from the obvious difference, isn't it, in topography? No observable distant, uh, differences in color, uh, but then uh, the sun's angle was always somewhat different yeah. over there, so it would be difficult to make a uh, general uh, correlation. Mm. Uh, I would say the topography is the striking yeah, change. Yeah. Of course, as uh, all your viewers mm. know, there are no seas on the far <laughs> side of the moon, and it is, uh, it's all uh, highlands and uh, high mountains, big craters. So uh, it's strikingly different from the... The weakness continues. I would say the topography is future conditional tense. Even in this singular opinion, he does not give a reliable connection. There's just one, more thing, I'd, one more thing I'd like to ask you. Uh, you're one of the very, very few people, I think, whose opinion on this is really worth having. In fact, there are only four of you. Do you think, from your knowledge of the moon, having been there, that it is going to be possible in the foreseeable future to set up scientific bases there on anything like a large scale? Oh, I'm quite certain that we'll have such bases uh, in our lifetime, uh, somewhat like the Antarctic stations uh, and similar scientific outposts, continually manned. Although, uh, certainly, there's the problem of the environment, the vacuum, and the high and low temperatures of day and night, still in all, in many ways, it's more hospitable than Antarctica might be. Uh, there are no storms, no snow, no high winds, no unpredictable weather uh, phenomena that we're yet uh, aware of, and the gravity is a very pleasant kind of place to work in, better than here on Earth, and uh, I, I think it would be quite, quite a pleasant place to do scientific work and quite practical.
Mr. Armstrong, thank you very much. And again, let me say what a tremendous honor and privilege it's been to have you with us. Thank you. Here we have the use of two personal connections, I, with both qualified. The first is, oh, I'm quite certain that we'll have such bases in our lifetime. Here he is not only certain, but calls upon the reinforcement of being quite certain. The second use is with a slight stutter on the pronoun I, which suggests the possibility of increase of nervousness. In analysis, this is called the stuttering I and is used to measure anxiety. We use the pronoun I millions of times in life. The brain's efficiency is extreme in this regard. When a non-stutterer halts or stutters on the pronoun I, the commitment psychologically comes into question with nervousness, possibly moving into anxiety and tension. He moves the topic to Antarctica, which is similar to going to another Apollo mission above. Yet we ask, what topic produced the stutter on the pronoun I? The emotion produced regarding a space station. And uh, I, I think it would be quite, quite a pleasant place to do scientific work and quite practical. The emotion he relates to the future station is pleasant for a specific reason, to do scientific work. Why might this create nervousness or even stress? Okay, so Peter Hyatt now gives his um, conclusions. He says, Neil Armstrong does not linguistically connect himself to the lunar landing. This is evident in his consistent distancing language, including intuitive pronouns and passivity. What may have caused this? So Peter Hyatt now gives four possibilities. Remember, he's a professional analyst, so he's covering his bases here with these four possible reasons. And you'll see in a moment why I'm saying that. So the first possibility is that it, there's a, there is a security mandate. So Neil Armstrong's being told, you're not allowed to tell anyone about what you saw, right? The second is that this is his baseline. So in other words, he talks like this all the time, even when he's talking to his wife. So <clears throat> say his wife said, Neil, did you enjoy yourself at the pub? He would say, when you go to the pub, <laughs> You do enjoy yourself if, if you have a beer with your friends. He goes around talking like that, right? So I don't, I don't put much credibility in option two. Option three, he's a liar. He's deceptive. Lack of commitment mimics deceptive language. The lack of personal commitment in context is stark. Like I say, um, Peter Hyatt obviously didn't want to put all his eggs in one basket. The fourth is unknown. Okay, so he's, he's, he's hedging his bets a little bit. Um, but I know where my belief lies there. In my personally, I think it's number three. I, I don't think Neil Armstrong walked on the lunar surface. And you've also got to bear in mind here that Peter Hyatt is an American who completely believed the Apollo story. He wasn't aware of any conspiracy stuff before he did this analysis. So this is a 100% believer. Okay. So in his emails with me after he did this analysis, this is what he said. This was so unexpected that I ran it by another analyst. I grew up at age seven with this account. There's a strong emotional connection with childhood national pride. The teachers repeatedly visited it, including newsreels. I did not expect this. I originally felt guilty wasting your money. Your money. But after the first few answers where he is linguistically nowhere to be found, I realized that there is more here than what is ridiculed. Heather too, that's his wife, who was also a trained analyst, is shocked. We both said the same thing. Things we dismissed as crazy years ago have been proven true more and more. We need to stay more open and explore. The analysis that I presented at that lecture was not the full analysis. There is, there is more in this document from Peter Hyatt, and I am going to make this available as a download. Right? So this is quite extensive analysis. Now, there's one particular interview with an astronaut. This is Buzz Aldrin that, that I was very interested in. So this is Bart Zabrell, um, the chap who made the, the film uh, Astronauts Gone Wild. And m my opinion on that interview is that it's very telling because it, I felt that Buzz Aldrin was almost admitting to something in that interview. What, what were your feelings on that, Andrew? Yes, it, it does seem like he was, you know, he was trying to pass the book to somebody else. He says, you know, you should go and talk to the NASA administrator. We were just guys going on a flight. Uh, he didn't really seem to be that interested in saying, oh, yeah, we definitely went, you know, and th this is how we prove it. He didn't really come back with any of that. And he sort of quickly went into the uh, more personal attacks, you know, and saying mm -hmm. that Bart Sabrell was on an ego trip or something. And, and so 
uh, again, people should watch that interview as well as you know watching right. what you're going to show next. Right. Yeah. So again, the Buzz Aldrin interview, you can download the analysis um, from the website, and I did think it was going to throw up more than it did, but essentially what Peter Hyatt points out is that um, Bart Zabrell asks Buzz Aldrin a very, very difficult question. In fact, it's not a question. It's, he makes a statement. He says, I know you didn't walk on the moon. And, uh, and what Peter Hyatt says, well, that was the end of the interview. Buzz Aldrin was not going to give any more information or entertain the guy. He was just trying to get him out of his office from that point. As soon as he's made that accusation, Peter Hyatt saying, end of interview. You're not going to get any more useful information out of him. So Peter Hyatt describes it as a missed opportunity. But I would be sympathetic with Bart Zabrell in as much as it's clearly a very emotional subject for him. He's convinced that he's been lied to and he's got the man in front of him there. And to be cool and calm and collected and analytical in these situations is, is perhaps not as easy as it sounds. It's very difficult, yeah. And I mean, both you and I, you know, we, I think we originally thought the Apollo missions were real and... You know, I was certain, personally very upset when I realised that they couldn't have been real. So, But certainly the, the, the Buzz Aldrin analysis, there's nothing in, in there to indicate that he went to the moon. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it doesn't go as far as perhaps as, as, as the Neil, it's not as revealing as the Neil Armstrong one. Um, but one thing that, in order to get Peter Hyatt to do the analysis, I had to tra you have to do a transcript, every word you've got to put into a document. And it's in a room with... It, the, the, Not the very good acoustics. Yeah. yeah, the acoustics aren't perfect. So there was a great deal of information in the language. I had to replay several sections over and over again to f figure out what the words were. And a lot more comes out. In the, so if you read the subtitles and see what Bart Zabrell is actually saying to him and what, uh, what um, Aldrin is replying. So to set the scene... Bart Zabrell, who was very sceptical of the Apollo missions, he doesn't believe they went to the moon, he manages to get in front of Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin doesn't really know he's going to be challenged, he just knows it's some media interview. Uh, and then Bart Zabrell produces this, this very damning piece of evidence, this tape of them faking the, the shot of the Earth out the window to make the Earth look further away. And you can see Buzz Aldrin's reaction to that, he's stunned by it because he doesn't, he doesn't know it's in the public domain and he starts asking him how he's got a hold of it. That's right, and that film is in uh, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. That clip is shown in bits in Astronauts Gone Wild, but if they want to see the whole clip, that's in the other film of Bart Sprills, which is A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. Before I show the analysis, just a quick word about Bart Sabrell. I highly recommend watching his films, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon and Astronauts Gone Wild. In researching and making these films, Bart Sabrell has showed great resourcefulness and courage in bringing to light new information about the validity of the Apollo missions and shining a light on the astronauts involved. So I would like to thank him for all his hard work. Now I sent professional statement analyst Peter Hyatt a transcript of Bart Zabrell's Buzz Aldrin interview with the intention of finding out from Buzz Aldrin's own words whether he was lying and what might be being concealed. In doing the analysis, Peter also analyzes Bart Zabrell's words and his interview technique. Peter compares Bart's interaction with Buzz Aldrin with how a professionally trained statement analyst would conduct such an interview. In doing this, he is very critical of Bart Zabrell. I just want to point out that my intention in having this interview analysed was to find out about Buzz Aldrin and what his language reveals, not necessarily to be critical of Bart Zabrell. So please don't take the comments too personally, Bart. I think you achieved a great deal just by managing to get a camera in front of Buzz Aldrin and all the other astronauts and challenge them while they were on camera. Anyway, here's the analysis. I mean, do you have Neil Armstrong interviewed already? The interview begins with the subject posing a question about his flight team member. Please consider this is a possible defensive posture on the part of the subject. In a prior interview, there was a linguistic reluctance to commit to information about the lunar landing. The analysis of that interview concluded that this could be from a number of reasons with two dominant themes. One, the subject did not experience lunar landing. Two, the subject did experience lunar landing but was under strict orders to not disclose information about such as part of national security. Consider that either point would lead to passivity as part of a weak linguistic commitment. 
Here, we may consider that the subject, Aldrin, does not wish to be psychologically alone with the possible disclosure of classified information. It could be classified due to military necessity, whether it was a military form of deception to cause other nations to believe the United States held technological advantage or not, the language would be the same. An example of this is found in medical privacy laws and statutes. Not only are medical professionals bound by confidentiality, but the consequences of such will impact language. This is true of any profession in which effort must be made to conceal information. No, he, he doesn't want to be interviewed. Well, I, I know. The subject recognises that the member of his team does not want to be interviewed. Please consider the possibility that before the interview begins, our subject does not wish to be interviewed either. This is not lost on the interviewer. Why does he, why does he not give interviews? The question is specifically seeking why the reluctance to give information exists. <clears throat> well, because that's his personal uh, choice. And I guess it's mine, in a way, to do things uh, when they've been uh, researched and worked out as far as a business arrangement. This is not news. This is not an anniversary. One, the subject does not refute reluctance. Two, the subject reports that the choice to not want to give an interview is a personal choice. He does not say, I don't know, and you will have to ask him but tells us in an unnecessary statement. By calling it his personal choice, any choice to not want to give an interview would be personal. This is therefore unnecessary to state, making it very important information. He does not say that's his choice, but gives us additional information by the word personal. The subject introduces this as a personal choice, which then can be asked what other choice would there be? A professional choice? A legal choice? A professional choice could be one in which payment is part of the equation. A legal choice would be a choice based upon possible legal ramifications regarding the information of an interview. By telling us it is his personal choice, the subject is inadvertently raising questions as to the possibility of other elements of choice and restriction. This should have led to a journalist to consider a question such as, would he be under any restrictions to discuss this in some form? The topic should be explored. That the subject may be himself concerned about this is to be considered. Now we are given affirmation that personal choice has introduced other options or choices for the subject. First, he makes a weak commitment to this with I guess. Next, he takes ownership of his choice with mine. Then he qualifies this unnecessary freedom of choice by qualifying it with in a way. The reader or analyst should now consider why reluctance is part of the interview. At the date of this interview, our subject is uncertain as to what he may or may not be free to say. This is to strongly suggest that there was a time when the subject and his team member were not free to choose to disclose information via interviews. This is consistent with the analysis of the prior interview. What is it that causes this reluctance? Here he introduces business arrangement, which may relate to professional choice, where he is paid for the information. We should now consider the topic of business as on his mind, yet the next sentence also shows some reluctance. 1. He reports in the negative what is not. This elevates the topic in importance. 2. He tells us that this is not news. 3. And it is not an anniversary. We note that news comes before anniversary. If he reported that it was not an anniversary, it may suggest that he does not see the need for an interview. We would wonder, however, why our subject would consider only an anniversary as to be the reason for an interview. This is not news. In the negative, the subject affirms what the interview is not, i.e. news. There are two points within statement analysis that elevate this sentence. A. This is an unnecessary statement. B. It is given in the negative. With these two elements, the subject himself has led us to wonder, is this news? By asserting to a journalist or interviewer that it is not news, while not as a result of a direct question, this statement is very important to the subject. Why? The subject indicates a reluctant or defensive posture. The interviewer recognises this and compares it to what he has via the word actually. 
Well, actually it is. We found a, a very unique reel of footage that we have queued up to show you. Yeah. The subject only acknowledges this with, yeah, offering no comment, no question. He has told the interviewer that it is not news and it is not the anniversary, which questions the reason for the interview. He has been answered, but offers no reply beyond agreement. And it's from the mission, and to our knowledge, no one has ever seen it before. Mm. And it's 30 years old. Consider that the subject is reluctant to share information, which increases his defensive posture, and upon being given further information by the interviewer, thus showing him that it is in fact news, the subject responds to the statement with a question. And, and you want me to see this while you have me on camera? We have confirmation that the subject's concern is exposure of information from him to the public. Note that while speaks to the element of time, not content. This suggests that the subject may have preferred being shown in private, that is, off camera. He was asked to tell us what it is, and answered with a question about being on camera. Therefore, being asked about something related to his work that he is not aware of has increased his sensitivity to the topic. It is important to consider that under general or normal conditions in any profession, the topic of what the footage is would elicit a question or comment rather than the timing of such. Our subject is concerned about privacy or confidentiality. He has answered via a question telling us that the topic is very sensitive to him. Well, and to, and to tell us what it is. This is an unnecessary statement. <laughs> I mean, it, it's... Well, I don't know why I should do that. Any professional who is free to talk about his profession would likely ask about the content of the footage, perhaps even with great interest given how it was introduced. For the subject, it provoked a question about disclosure, and here it produced an interruption, not about the material itself. We must now consider this in light of the weak assertion, I guess, of the subject's choice to allow an interview. He reports in a statement what he does not know. He began with a pause, well, and tells us what he does not know. He does not report ignorance of the topic, but of his choice. This has caused a considerable increase in tension for the subject, the unknown footage. The tension is not related to what the subject may or may not know, but it created the increase in tension regarding the reason why he would speak specifically on camera. We now have confirmation about the sensitivity of personal choice, as the subject indicates that he may not have personal choice to comment on what he has not seen yet. Note the language that follows. Not only does he interrupt the interviewer, but specifically shows us the indicators of tension. It's a, it, well, it's a very it, unique it, I, well, footage. It, what would be very unique would be only to the public, not to an eyewitness who was there. Maybe that I need to see it, and then we sit down and we talk about what you're taking a picture of. I don't see where there's an advantage in it for me to do what you're asking me to do. I see all sorts of pitfalls. I see <clears throat> people who have managed to talk to somebody. Who did you talk to in our office? The subject begins with a pause. Well, indicating a need to think for answers. The subject acknowledges that it may be that the interviewer has very unique, never seen before footage. This is to affirm the possibility of such existence. He then weighs this possibility via the comparison but with his need. The pronouns here must be followed, but I need to see it. Without disputing the existence of very unique footage, the subject makes a very strong statement, I need to see it, without qualification. Here he does not use I guess or an exercise of personal choice. This is very important to him. It is not, however, all that he must have, but I need to see it and then we sit down and we talk about it. And then is the passage of time. Not only does this choice of wording reveal his need to see it, but there will be time for him to process the information. We sit down is to A, reveal tension, body posture, sitting down, B, demand for unity that we, this unity will only come after he himself has viewed what the interviewer has and see, and we talk about it, is to repeat the emphasis on unity. Question, what might be the pause of time here? 
Answer, the subject must be convinced that he himself has the cooperation, unity of the interviewer. He did not say, and then we talk about it, but said, we sit down and we, which is an unnecessary emphasis on unity, talk about it. Before they talk about it, they will sit down. This slows down the pace, increases tension and tells us that the subject will not disclose information or even continue the interview until the subject is convinced that there is unity, agreement between himself and the interviewer. And then we sit down and we talk about it. Next, we now see why he could only guess about personal choice. I don't see where there's an advantage, pause, in it for me to do what you're asking me to do. This breaks the unity of we and now goes back to I in which he reports what he does not see. He does not see the advantage. Then there is a pause which signals increase in sensitivity in the need for more consideration where he adds, for me, the subject has turned this back on himself. Recall he referenced the element of time but not the topic. Now he introduces advantage for himself. Question. Is the subject disagreeing because he is not being paid? Here the subject acknowledges that he has knowledge that people have gained access to somebody. That these people have managed suggests considerable effort and success. This may be due to various reasons including a difficulty in identifying those in authority or b managing through barriers to actually talk to one in authority. Not only does the sentence tell us that it is so challenging to get through to authority, but that our subject wants to know the name of the official that the interviewer talked to. This now answers the question as to why there is reluctance. It is not due to money, but requires somebody from our office to be notified. Our subject needs some sort of permission to speak freely in the interview, even after the lengthy passage of time. I talked with uh, Heather at Tor Books. Yeah. But is this helping book promotion? Are you going to be putting anything out during the time that I'm marketing books? The subject asked a direct question that the interviewer did not answer regarding helping book promotion. The subject then asked another question that specifically called for an answer of what he himself would be marketing. The interviewer did not answer. Regardless of the topic, that is a breach of trust. The interviewer is seeking information but will not provide information. This will always put the interviewee into a defensive posture. Consider that this is the third element of defensive posture for the subject. 1. Professional payment. 2. Permission from his office. 3. Lack of unity and trust between the interviewer and the subject. So Heather is not, does not represent me for the things you're talking about. She represents... Uh, um, a book selling activity. He speaks directly about publicity and representation, but not about any permission or confidentiality issues. The refusal to answer has likely settled the subject into his already established defensive posture. It is a significant mistake in journalism. The subject, via answering questions, is vulnerable and now trust is broken. I think when you see the footage, you'll you'll see that it's what? very extraordinary, one of a kind, okay. behind the scenes yeah. type of footage. Yeah. Well, if it is, why do you have access to something that no one else has seen before? He now turns into the interviewer. Trust is broken as he challenges the interviewer, not with how, but why. This reduces sensitivity towards the footage down and sensitivity personally towards the interviewer upward. Serendipity, I guess. And uh, it was recorded on the 18th of what? Of July, 1969. Do you remember this? On the 18th? Aldrin watches the footage. The footage shows the Earth filmed from within the Apollo 11 spacecraft at a time when the mission was supposed to be halfway to the moon. The footage shows the astronauts filming the Earth from the back of the spacecraft through a circular window a number of feet away. It is claimed they are using a crescent-shaped insert in the circular window in order to mimic the Earth's terminator, the line between day and night, 
so that the Earth appears to be much further away than it actually was. The lights are turned out within the spacecraft, making the space within the spacecraft indistinguishable from the space outside the spacecraft surrounding the Earth. Sibrel believes Apollo 11 was in a low Earth orbit for the duration of the mission, and these shots were being made by the astronauts to possibly be used to convince the public that Apollo 11 was on its journey to the moon. The final shot shows Michael Collins with the Earth outside the window looking very large, indicating Apollo 11 probably was in a low Earth orbit at this time. Hello, Apollo 11. Houston, Goldstone says that the TV looks uh, great. Over. Roger, Neil, we just wanted a narrative such a weekend when we get the playback, we can sort of correlate what we're saying. Thank you very much. Well, we shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a, uh, the uh, number one window, and there isn't any uh, reflected light. We only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth, and it's filled up with a TV camera. South America becomes invisible just off beyond the Terminator or inside the shadow. We can see uh, the oceans with uh, a definite blue cast, see white bands of major cloud formations across the Earth. Uh, Roger, the ATC is working real well. The F-22 looks good, over. So Apollo 11, Houston, uh, did you copy, over? Uh, Roger, your transmissions the last couple of times have been about uh, two by over. Okay, how do you read me now? Right, you're five by now. Coming in, uh, can't quite make out who that had. What, what is your uh, proposition that we didn't go to the moon? In effect, the interview ended when the interviewer betrayed the subject by his silence. It now turns into a challenge and the opportunity is lost. I know for a fact that you did. This is a critical mistake on top of a critical mistake. Here, he could have presented the topic as doubt, not as for fact, which technically weakens the assertion while increasing the challenge personally to the subject. This challenge, which should have been avoided, was not expected by the subject. Journalists seek information by trade, not press narrative. This is how to lose a subject. You know for a fact that we did not. The topic is very sensitive to our subject. In parroting back the words, a. The subject retorts in question form, and B. Changes the pronoun you to we in the answer. This suggests that the defensive posture is not only high, but it is now something in which the subject does not wish to be alone psychologically with. The subject does not want to be accused of not going by himself, but as a team with others. That's correct, as you'll see this came from the Foolishness compounded. The interviewer ended the interview, not the subject, and not the topic. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not interested in, in satisfying your suppositions when there's all this evidence that we did. This is an unexpected and weak assertion. It goes to evidence. This is a subtle form of distancing language. When one experiences something personally, particularly something that is dramatic or historic, the expected language will always be his personal experience. The subject will not have need for, nor interest in evidence. This is the psychological wall of truth that shows itself strongly in language. It is not here. This proves, as you see, that you are using the window to demonstrate that you were halfway to the moon when you were doing Turn the camera off, please. Turn the camera off. You're full of shit. It is personal. This is why an interviewer must never break trust with the subject. He could have said, I would like to learn, and I would like to write the truth in a book, and I am open to learn about this footage. 
Instead, he presented it in the form of an accusation. Note that the subject had previously used the pronoun we to describe them, even though it was in increased tension, it was still unity. The topic did not break the unity. The subject himself did not break the unity. Then you're in Earth orbit. Now if the moon was three days away, and this is late, on the 18th, how could you possibly walk on the moon two days later when this was shot on the 18th? And you want me to sit in front of a camera while you're taking pictures, you're showing this, and then you want to see my reaction? This is a challenge that could have been diffused with honesty. Yes, this way we can learn from you, or anything similar. By repeating the word fact, the interviewer only increases the resistance of the subject. I know for a fact that's that slimy do. journalism. Do you realize that? If, if, if you, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. The document that I have in here, you'll find that, that it's this not. Is a view of Earth from that this is a personal plea to do what is right. Mm -hmm. Virtue signaling is also insulting, which only increases the resistance. This is a very poorly conducted interview. By using personal plea, however, he got the subject's attention, who turns back into his earlier offer. Well, we sit and we talk about things ahead of time. Analytical interviewing rule 101, do not interrupt the subject. It is likely that the lack of trust could have been repaired by reviewing the material off camera. This should have been agreed to as it is disarming and would have allowed the interviewer to get information one way or another. The interviewer shows that he is not interested in the truth, but in pushing his narrative. The interviewer's own weakness continues in his repetition of fact. But what it is you're trying to do is unethical. You don't believe that? The subject asked the interviewer a question and the interviewer refused to answer. The subject asked the interviewer a second question of which he was refused. The subject now introduces ethics. No, I do not. Well, I think we have a difference of opinion. The circumference of the window. This is where you're using the window, the yeah. spacecraft, to appear to be the Earth far away. Yeah. We got the raw footage of it. We have an auxiliary track, someone prompting you when to speak. You believe in UFOs? No, I do not. You believe we've been visited by. Well, why do you want to believe this? The need to ridicule the interviewer suggests the sensitivity of the information. Unfortunately, the interviewer made sure that the sensitivity to the information would not be addressed. I know for, I know for a fact we've had this analyzed, and, and this, this is the window, and you're in, and it's dated by an atomic clock at the Goldstone tracking station, which is on the tape. Well, you're talking to the wrong guy. Why don't you talk to the administrator at NASA? We're passengers. We're, we're guys going on a flight. We're not... A. Question form is regarding authority. B. Sentence in the present tense is unreliable. C. He was about to tell us in the negative, we are not. But it will not be known because the interviewer interrupted the subject. I know for a fact that it didn't happen. And this tape would prove it in a court of law. Subsequently, this tape was never used. It would. Try. Why don't you put your money into a court of law and see how people laugh at you? You want it. No, no, that's not. Is camera working? The subject is concerned about how he will come off on camera. This is the result of not only sensitive information, but broken trust personally. The subject likely is concerned that the journalist who has condemned him will wish to portray him personally as one in guilt. No, no, no one has laughed. It is likely that the journalist has been laughed at. And, and this makes you the, the real famous person who has discovered this and reveals all this stuff. What an ego you must have to want to propel yourself like this. The wording used by the subject here, while attempting to insult, reveals sensitivity towards the topic, not only the interviewer. This is why accusations should be made reluctantly, only when absolutely necessary and without morals. That's not why I'm doing it, and God knows that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for the truth to come out because I think it was wrong. The self-justification is another mistake for a journalist. This has set up disparity. The journalist knows right from wrong, and the subject is wrong. There is no unity in this, and the information now greatly hindered as it turns personal, to condemn the journalist and defend self. It moves emotion away from the topic, which would have granted the most yield, and towards personal justification. Doing it for the truth is a positive, but because I think it is wrong, whether accurate or not, condemns the subject as the wrongdoer and pushes him into an even greater defensive posture. This will lead him to defend himself rather than the mission or any details of the mission. 
the journalist increases the personal pressure which then causes us to view any sensitive reaction in the same way. One is wrong and has to defend himself. So he is not wrong, but the interviewer is wrong. While this is being done, valuable potential information is lost. And also notice how the astronaut... No, but you're doing it the wrong way. You don't mislead somebody like me to come in here. To the subject addresses the betrayal. Alden was told he was wrong and now tells the journalist that the journalist is wrong. Note the self-importance. Somebody like me follows the ridicule of the journalist becoming famous in discovery. We might have gotten some insight into the topic discovered had the journalist not made this personal, good guy versus bad guy. Far better would be to allow the subject to see the material and know what it is about and to decline to discuss it, only to be asked why he had a need not to discuss, including asking, are there any military reasons in some form? By setting up an adversarial relationship, the journalist lost the opportunity. If you didn't go to the moon, that's misleading people. I'm, I'm showing you okay, this Okay, we went to the moon, we're not misleading anybody. This is not a strong assertion because A, it is parroted language, which reduces the element of internal stress if he was being deceptive, and B, it did not use the pronoun I as expected in a most personal historic event. It is unreliable as it stands. Then how is it possible this that is this, this is the window that's it shot recorded. to make Much it look like it's Look, you can manufacture away. all you want. This is a weak accusation, but we cannot conclude it is from the content. This is why making it personal through virtue signalling and condemning the subject loses the opportunity for information, including information gleaned specifically through the lens of statement analysis. This is straight. This isn't and manufactured. Sure. And you know that it isn't. So that's of an interior of the astronauts at work. I believe this would prove it in a court of law that you did not go to the moon. It's dated on the 18th. It proves when you remove it. You give me your business card. It's all in there. It's all in there. not throw light onto the spacecraft's wall. Here they remove part of the crescent insert. This proves that it's the window. You can see them removing the crescent insert that you did to create the Terminator line in front of the window. You're so full of shit, I can't believe it. If you show this publicly, you're open for a lawsuit. Okay? Again, it's personal. So the conclusions are, the journalist did not glean information on the topic due to the fault of the journalist alone. The subject was placed in a personally accusatory defensive posture while being interviewed on a sensitive topic. It was the sensitivity around the topic that would have given us insight. The journalist instead guided the subject to avoid the topic and defend himself and attack the journalist. The lens of statement analysis allows for us to discern not only truth from deception, but content analysis. Had the journalist not made such accusations, nor used morally charged language, he would have gotten information from the subject. Whether the subject never went to the moon, or if he did and is not permitted to speak about it from authorities, i.e. military, information could have been gleaned had the journalist remained open and unified with the subject. He did not. In the interview, the subject has the information. Each interruption lost information. Where there is a time for accusation is only at the end of an interview or when the subject refuses to answer. Viewing the subject's use of the pronoun we, the subject was, at the least, willing to speak off camera to learn what would be asked on camera. This would have been valuable information. Even if an agreement was reached before the camera was turned on, the journalist would have allowed for some information to be presented for analysis. The journalist's primary motive, according to his language, was not obtaining information. His repetition of the word fact showed increased sensitivity for the journalist himself. He has likely an acute need here for self-justification that would have been addressed in formal training. As interviewers, we allow subjects to condemn us if they wish, as long as they keep talking about the topic in hand. It is likely that the journalist, due to his own fault and perhaps from being personally accused of holding to a conspiracy theory, felt the need for self-justification and allowed it to overrule his effort to obtain information. The topic is very sensitive to both parties. One showed a strong need for avoidance, while the journalist possesses a strong need to prove his belief. In any interview, the interviewer will get one of two impressions. Either the subject is working with them to facilitate the flow of information, or he is working against the interview to hinder it. Buzz Aldrin began with a defensive posture. 
he introduced payment, representation, but also the sensitive topic of authority. Our subject was acutely aware of the need, even years later, for official permission to speak freely. This is in fact something that did come out of this interview as part of the analysis conclusion. Aldrin does need permission to freely choose to share information about a mission many years prior. This is evident from his words regarding his fellow astronaut's choice. Why is this? Although money was mentioned, which may go back to an official position where being paid for appearances needed approval, it does not appear strongly linked in the language. Classified information. Information remains classified for many decades. Those with experiential memory of a historical event will have it reflected in their language. If they must conceal the information, regardless of the cause of concealment, it will put them under considerable stress and will show itself in the language. This concealment will often be seen linguistically through a lack of commitment. Passivity, passive voice, as well as skipping over time is expected. This event, whether it was actual or was a military bluff, was a historic event for them. The language will reflect this. The defensive posture of the subject was already high before the journalist raised it to the point of effectively ending the interview. The origin of defensive posture and sensitivity towards the topic itself is not known here. The journalist made this into good guy versus bad guy, which hindered significantly the ability to obtain knowledge. Had the journalist challenged him without virtue signalling, we may have gotten a significant yield from Aldrin's words. For those looking to learn the truth as to whether or not the lunar landing took place, this was a lost opportunity. And interestingly, around that time, that's when Buzz Aldrin punches him in the face, isn't it? Yeah, I think it was... Yeah, I think when he was going out of the hotel, or maybe the next day when he went back, yeah, that's when there's this altercation and uh, which results in physical violence. Mm. You really like it, You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black, if you ever thought of it. Saying Will I you misrepresented get it myself. Away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. Andrew and I have both recently been contacted by Albino Gallopini. Gallopini, who has written a autobiography of Bill Casing. A biography. Yeah, because he, he would have written it himself. <laughs> autobiography is... Uh, right. yeah. yeah. So just can you give us some information on that, Andrew? Yes, well, we were contacted because um, Albino had, had had this information that we talked about this in your lecture uh, tour that uh, Bill Casing had started work on a film script for, um, you know, a film around, based around the story of them hoaxing the moon landings. And then at some point he became aware that there was another film script which was in progress, which was actually the Capricorn One film script. I think Capricorn One was released in 1978, I think. And um, Albino, uh, had, I, I think he got to know Bill Casing's family and he also got this document, which was from one of Bill Casing's lawyers, where he said that uh, they had managed to register a film script about this idea of a fake mission to Mars, but it was actually essentially the same as Bill Casing's film script. But they put a copyright on it, and the copyright predated the filing of any copyright date that Casing had got on his screenplay. Mm. And the lawyer had found this out and said, well, whoever's got the power to actually manipulate the dates like this on these filings, I don't really want to mess with those people. You know, I've got a family, so we're just going to have to leave it. So I explain all this in one of my lectures. I'll yeah. put the link on the screen if you want to know what Andrew's talking about. They prevented Bill Casing from making the film that he wanted to make about the moon landings. That's by right. Changing, by copying his script and then changing the story slightly to, to make it about Mars, and then they made the film, so he couldn't make his film. That's right. You know, and, and, and uh, Albino uh, decided to write this biography of Casing because he was a very unusual chap and obviously he'd brought all this information out, so I think he was interested in the backdrop to that, and it's now available on Lulu. Um, I did encourage Albino to post it on Amazon as well, but I don't know if, uh, because they have a bigger readership, but I don't know if he's done that as well. Um, but uh, a very interesting man, uh, Bill Casing, yeah. and uh, probably worth reading his, his biography to find out more about you know, what motivated him to disclose the, uh, 
the moon hoax uh, stuff that he knew. Right. And I'm just going to show another clip from the lecture now where I mentioned Bill Casing because Bill Casing was one of the first people who started to suggest that the, that the moon landings may not have happened. And he wrote this very early in, in, in his 1970s book, We Never Went to the Moon. So I mentioned that in this next clip. OK, so what's going on here? If they didn't land Apollo 11 on the moon, did they land 12 or 14 or 15? Because there are six missions that NASA claim landed on the moon. Did any of them go? Were they getting a bit nearer each time? Well, let's present some evidence from Apollo 17, the last mission which supposedly landed on the lunar surface. Um, here are two photographs from that mission. If we look at the top one, um, we've, we've featured this on Rich Planet before, but I think it's important to go through it again. So what we're led to believe here, if you just look at the top image, is that the lunar land has come down, it's landed on the lunar surface, the astronauts have got out, climbed down this ladder, and they've walked towards the camera. One of them's turned around and taken a snapshot of the lunar lander with some hills in the background. They've then continued walking in the same direction, 150 metres. One of them has then started doing a little experiment. The other one turns around and takes a photograph of him with the background. So you can see the lunar lander here in the two shots. Now just look at the backdrops. Look how similar they are. Look at Hill B here with this shading on it. What are the chances on Earth if me and you get out of a car and I take a photograph of the car and then we walk 150 metres down the road and I take a photograph of you with a car in the background? What are the chances of getting an almost identical backdrop, right? Now, a skeptic contacted me and said, no, no, the backdrops aren't identical if you look very closely. There's slight differences in shadows and things here. Well, if what they tell us is true, that, the, that there was front screen projection system that was used, i.e. thousands of tiny beads uh, reflecting an image, perhaps these uh, images were also taken on, the, on a different day, you are going to get di uh, differences. They're not going to be identical. It would, it's not like compositing a green screen image where the images would be identical. So you would expect slight differences in shadow and that kind of thing, which is exactly what we see. So this is, this is very strong evidence, in my opinion, that those, these photographs are taken in a studio. People have even worked out the size of this studio. You're talking a huge studio, probably in a hangar, uh, of the order of 300 meters uh, to the actual backdrop. Uh, so um, it doesn't look good for NASA. Now, this doesn't prove that Apollo 17 didn't land. It just proves that they've faked some photographs uh, in a studio, or it's strong evidence that they've faked some photographs in a studio. So. I think they're very, very worried about this evidence, the evidence of Apollo 11, the new evidence that I've just showed you, because um, it doesn't look good for NASA. And that's why we get articles like this one. This appeared in the Metro newspaper last year, titled, Here's Why the Moon Landings Weren't Faked. New Conspiracy Study Proves It. So they feel the need to deny moon conspiracy theories. So it says, in the wilder reaches of the internet, lots of people still believe that NASA faked the moon landings and possibly even its entire space program. But it's absolute balls, a new study has shown. It would have simply uh, been impossible to keep it a secret, according to Oxford scientists. If the moon landings had been a hoax involving an estimated 411,000 people, it would have been found out in three years and eight months. <laughs> British physicist Dr. David Grimes worked out a mathematical way to calculate the chances of a plot being deliberately leaked by a whistleblower or accidentally uncovered. Now then, what this shows is that Dr. David Grimes has done no research into what moon ho uh, hoax researchers claim, right? So if you read one of the earliest books by Bill Casing written in the 1970s called We Never Went to the Moon, he explains that the whole thing was done without informing all of NASA. In fact, only informing a tiny handful of people. It's all in his book. So why hasn't David, uh, Dr. Grimes looked at this book? So in Bill Casing's book, uh, Bill Casing was a technologist. He worked on some of the Apollo technology. Um, he explains, yes, there was a visible NASA Apollo program, um, but there was also another secret project called the ASP, the Apollo Simulation Project. This is all in Bill Casing's book. And he claims that they had a secret base in Nevada, so a considerable sum of money spent on this group that was used to hoax the mission, between um, four and seven billion dollars. But even that group, even the secret group that was hoaxing the mission was being run to Manhattan Project style rules. So only a few people underneath actually knew 
what was going on. So the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb, only six people knew what they were doing. And Bill Casing claims that with the, with the hoax moon landings, uh, it was the same. So let me give you a little example. In my career as an engineer, the company I worked for used to build these things. This is a, a, a generator in a power station, produces the electricity that comes in your home. So I worked for a company called NEI that used to build these. And I worked in the control systems department. So when you have a huge generator like, like this, you have a rack of electronics called an AVR, automatic voltage regulator, which would look something like that. And it's controlling all aspects of that generator, the voltage and the frequencies and that kind of thing. Now, what you, will, what you do not do is build your control system and just plug it in and expect it to work, because these cost millions of pounds to build. So what you do is you build a, you build a simulator. So you, it's a box of electronics which will emulate in every respect that piece of hardware, that 500 megawatt generator. And in my time at NAI, this is one of the projects that I was involved with. There's the specifications, Richard. There's an electronics lab. Go ahead and build the generator simulator. So once that's built, the AVR, the control system, is then plugged into it, and then is used, so the simulator is used to test and debug the control system. So you know that it's all working correctly because you've, you've proved it with a simulator. And only then do you take it to your power station, and then you know it's going to work. So the point I'm making is that simulators are a very important part in engineering. They're used all over the place. I've worked on two or three different simulator projects in my time as an engineer. Now, if you consider the control desks at NASA for these various Apollo missions, um, some of these desks might be just monitoring things on the mission. Others might be actually sending data to the mission and controlling things. So all this technology would need to be tested. You wouldn't just build these desks and then use it live on a mission. You would build a simulator. So that simulator would simulate everything in the Apollo uh, rocket, and it would simulate all of the communication data. Now that simulator might be in the same room. It could be in a different. Uh, it could be in a different city because it's a comms simulator. But the point is, engineers would be tasked to build a simulator to test the control room. <clears throat> now those guys would not be told, "Hey, we're going to use this to fake the mission." But that technology that they built could well be. <clears throat> so the same applies to the sets. They wouldn't if they're building these three hundred meter sets with their front screen projection systems, right? They're not going to tell all the guys building them what they're being, what they're for. Well, we're hoaxing the mission, lads. Come on, we put the front screen projection up. They don't. That's not how they work. They're told, well, this is for publicity. Okay, so that's how it works, and it's all explained in Bill Casing's 1970s book. We never went to the moon. So, as I say, Dr. David Grimes has done no work, no research. So I wrote to Dr. David Grimes to tell him this, and um, I didn't get a reply. So I explained to him what I've just explained to you, and I sent him a link to this book, little booklet that I've written all about Mars. Um, because as you may know, you may have seen some of the programs on Rich Planet. I've been working on this for a number of years now, and I'm fairly convinced now. It is a hypothesis, so I wouldn't stake my life on it, right? But I'm fairly convinced that none of the um, rovers and landers that they say they've sent to Mars landed on the, on the Martian service. I've challenged anyone to read this book and then um, after it think that they're on Mars. And in my opinion, it's been done in, this, in a very similar fashion to how they did it with Apollo, <laughs> where, the, where all these guys here who really did build a rover and it, they really did send it to the rocket, etc. but it never went to Mars. But all these guys believe it is on Mars. That's, that's how the conspiracies are run, in my opinion. And I communicated with this guy, Robert Manning, senior engineer on the Curiosity Project, and he agreed to answer any technical question that I put to him. So Andrew Johnson and myself, we drafted up 26 questions, and he answered one question and ran away from the rest. So if you want to read all of those questions and the emails that I've shared with uh, Robert Manning, it's all in that book. And you can decide for yourself whether you think they're lying or not. Okay, and just um, this Sunday, just gone, I noticed I was filling my van up with petrol on the way here, and uh, this is the front page of the Sunday Times, after I've just presented this new Peter Hyatt research, yeah? Front page of the Times, the last men on the moon win two tickets to see the astronauts. Is that a coincidence? <laughs> Makes you laugh.
So I'd like now to add some additional information that I've recorded after the talk. I just want to bring people's attention to this film, Operation Avalanche, because in my opinion it's a very clever piece of disinformation. Uh, the film itself follows a group of CIA operatives who are spying on NASA and they accidentally discover that NASA or a small part within NASA is planning to fake the moon landings. Now in my opinion this film speaks to two distinct audiences. The first audience that it speaks to is the audience that already believe the moon landings were faked. And what I think the message is that it's trying to put out to that group is that if the moon landings were faked, then it wasn't authorised. Um, you can't blame the government or NASA or, or the CIA or intelligence agencies. It was a renegade group within NASA that nobody had control of. So it's trying to dispel any blame from, from the current system. The second group that I think this film is speaking to is the larger group, which just believe the moon landings happened as they were reported. Now in this film, there's much evidence that moon hoax research has put forward is, is covered. So the Stanley Kubrick front screen projection is mentioned, the famous sea rock is mentioned, and many, many other pieces of evidence is mentioned in this film. So it's as if they're trying to mop up all of the evidence that moon hoax researchers have come forward with in order to debunk the moon landings and they've put it in this film to present it in a slightly wacky way to people who believe the moon landings were real. So if those people then encounter that evidence at a later date they're more likely to dismiss it because they've seen it in this wacky film. So that's what I think this film is up to, a very clever piece of disinformation. I'm going to read some comments now from Wikipedia about NASA. Just to point out, I don't read from Wikipedia because it represents truth. I read from Wikipedia because it represents the official narrative. It, it, it represents what NASA has told the public. So this is the first comment I want to draw people's attention to. Apollo set major milestones in human spaceflight. It stands alone in sending manned missions beyond low Earth orbit and landing humans on another celestial body. So just consider that. Nobody else, no country, no organisation other than the Apollo moon missions have sent anyone beyond low Earth orbit. Now if you consider the evidence that I've just presented, it's quite possible that those Apollo moon missions did not go beyond low Earth orbit. So what this is telling me, at least in the white world, the acknowledged space projects, possibly none of them have gone beyond low Earth orbit. Here's another quote from Wikipedia. The first manned flight of Orion, that's the new rocket that they're developing, and SLA, Exploration Mission 2 EM2, is to launch between 2019 and 2021. It is a 10 to 14 day mission planned to place a crew of four into lunar orbit. So it's going to take them till 2020 just to get a man to orbit the moon. Now according to NASA, there were eight missions in the 1960s which orbited the moon with men in the spacecraft. That was 50 years ago. So why is it taking them up until 2020 to do the same? In my opinion, this is more evidence that those 1960s missions probably did not go anywhere near the moon. Here's another quote. On December the 4th, 2006, NASA announced it was planning a permanent moon base. The goal was to start building the moon base by 2020 and by 2024 have a fully functional base. In 2010, President Barack Obama halted existing plans, including the moon base, and directed focus on manned missions to asteroids and Mars, as well as extending support for the International Space Station. So that's very, very unusual. What he's done, he's cancelled this moon project and replaced it with much more far-fetched or much more difficult projects, landing someone on an asteroid or on Mars. So again, I think this is, could be evidence that we haven't been, at least in the white world, we haven't been beyond low Earth orbit. And that brings about the question, is there some sort of constraint? Now, I've spoken about NASA, and I would suggest that NASA's projects, 
some of them are fraudulent, not all of them. I think some of the unmanned projects have been real. I think the space shuttle was real. I think the International Space Station is real. But I'm very doubtful about whether Neil Armstrong walked on the moon and I'm very doubtful about whether any of the Mars rover missions are real. So NASA's running frauds in my opinion. So it's possible then that white, at least white world projects have never left low Earth orbit, as I've suggested there. And we're going to look at some more evidence from Apollo missions now, Andrew. And yes. So we wanted to talk about the rocks first, is that right? We're going to yes, I mean, I'll just mention following on from the Bill Cating thing, just a couple of little things. You could probably get hold of Bill Cating's book. We never went to them in fairly easily. Uh, and there, I think there are various downloads of it available, as well as obviously paper copies. Same thing with Ralph Renee's book, which I recommend for people, um, which is uh, NASA Moon America. I had a couple of people writing to me about, for example, problems that would appear in the Apollo films with pressurization of the spacesuits uh, that they would, you know, they would inflate like a Michelin Man type of thing. And a lot of that is covered in Ralph Renee's book. And this chap that wrote to me hadn't, hadn't realized that. So again, people that are thinking of those things now and thinking, hang on, what about this? What about that? I suggest that they read Ralph Renee's book and watch as many of the videos that are available, such as the one on David Percy's website, allis.com, because you may find that a lot of that stuff is already covered in there. It's just that, you know, you were not yet aware of it. Right. Now, uh, one website that I would recommend is um, Jarrah White's website. Just tell us about him, Andrew. Yes, and that view, that was the logic that follows on that Jarrah White is uh, well, younger than us. I'm not quite sure how old he is. He, he describes himself as the, the grandson of the moon hoax or something. Uh, and he did get to know Ralph René before he died. And I think uh, Gerard White is now, um, you know, he's selling copies of uh, Ralph René's book. And Gerard White has done many videos on the Apollo hoax, many different aspects. Um, I did a broadcast with him um, three or four years ago um, with Morgan Reynolds, Dr. Morgan Reynolds, who also, you know, doesn't, uh, he's, he's sure like we are that they didn't go to the moon with the Apollo craft. And Gerard White has done many uh, useful videos, one of which we're going to discuss today, where he goes through a lot of the scientific data for various aspects of the missions. And one particular one that just come to my mind is about this account of the um, Russian Mir space station, where they put a Russian flag you know, outside the space station um, on one of the spacewalks that they did. And then uh, there was another comment made in, on a later mission where they said, well, we need to go and retrieve the flag because it's going to get in the way of this new equipment or something. And then the other cosmonaut says, no, don't bother. There's nothing left of it. It's all been you know, dissolved away by micrometeoroids and stuff. And Gerard White made a point of discussing this because NASA had claimed that they could still see evidence of the uh, flag on the moon that the you know, Apollo crew had left there after 40 years. But this other flag on the Mir space station, I think, had only been in space for about 18 months before there was just basically nothing left right. of it. And so he was making this comparison. You can watch, watch yeah. the video about that. His channel is called Moon Faker. And right. As you say, he's made hours and hours and hours of videos. And he's had cha many... Challenge in the moon missions. Yeah. And he, people who were connected to NASA have, have tried to challenge him, haven't they? Or they've Correct. tried to discredit him in different ways. Yes, and he's had many sort of DMCA, DMCA attacks on his channel, people filing spurious copyright claims, and all the you know, Apollo films are in the public domain anyway, you know, and that sort of thing. Right, so let's just touch on one of the things that he's covered, which is the, uh, well, it's the Chinese mission. So in 2013, China sent a rover to, to the moon, which was unmanned, and it, it, was, it had hardware on it which could um, collect samples of the soil and then analyze those samples using a, an X-ray spectrometer. And it then sent the data back through a, through a radio comms link yes. and produced a graph which has been published by the Chinese. It's, it's, um, I'll just put the graph up on the screen. It's probably not going to mean a lot to most viewers, but this is... Um, an X-ray spectroscopy graph, and what it, what you can derive from that, is the percentage composition for all of the different chemical elements, so such as um, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, potassium, calcium, titanium, chromium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you you really would need to watch the video to work out how Jarrah White has 
because uh, he has a scientific background in geology, doesn't he? I think something like that. Yes, um, yes, and, yes. And how he's how he's from this um, spectroscopy graph, he's worked out the percentages of the various different uh, elements. elements. Yes, and this video is called a Chinese road trip. I'm sure you Chinese ro so it's moon faker Chinese road trip. So you'd need to watch that to get the full details. And you probably need to watch it twice as well because it's very very dense with details. Right. Now, the rocks that. Um, the Apollo missions allegedly brought back. I can put this graphic up from Jarrah White's video. This shows a picture of the moon and the numbers there, 12, 14, 16, denote the various Apollo missions. So we've got Apollo 12 there, Apollo 14, 16, 11, 17. So this is where um, Apollo allegedly landed on the moon, the various sites. And the white arrow there we can see, this is where the Chinese uh, rover landed and took samples in that area. Now. The rocks that supposedly came back from the moon, um, you can get scientific data which has all been published on the chemical composition of those rocks. And the, the makeup of those rocks is very similar from the six Apollo sites, as he describes in the film. Right? But what Jarrell White has then done is compared the Chinese results with the published results that NASA have put out on the rocks. And what he, what he finds is that that someone's lying. Yeah. Someone's yeah. lying. Yeah. Um, so let's just look at magnesium. Like I say, in order to get the full reference and, and the reasoning or how these graphs have been derived, you'd need to watch the video. Uh, but we've got magnesium here. We see uh, on the right hand side there, that's the Chang'e 3, the Chinese mission, 0.2% uh, percent for magnesium. And we've got um, all of the Apollo missions, Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, much, much higher. And we can just zip through the various different elements. Aluminium, again, Chang E3, much, much lower in aluminium. Silicon. Potassium, no anomaly there. So Apollo 14, the rocks there had a slightly higher potassium content than the mm. rest of the Apollo missions. Mm. So there's no real anomaly there with potassium. Calcium, titanium, chromium, iron, again, no anomaly with iron, strontium, yttrium and zir zirconium. So the rocks that, that, that China have analysed are totally different, totally yes. different in, in, in almost every way to what NASA have allegedly brought back from the room. And I think Jarrell White suggests that the ones that, that, that Apollo claim to be from the moon, they're just from some remote part of the Earth probably. That's, that's what he suggests. Yeah, I think he makes some comparisons to certain uh, Earth geology to draw that conclusion. It is a very detailed video and very, very well done. Uh, I'm not sure it's something I'd be capable of making, but uh, I recommend people watch it and uh, you know, decide uh, what they think is uh, going on. Right, right. And just an, as an aside, with regards, Buzz Aldrin, Andrew sent me a video of um, Donald Trump doing some sort of presentation because allegedly Trump is relaunching some of these some certain space missions mm. and they had this gathering at the White House or wherever it was mm. and, and Buzz Aldrin was there. Just just tell us about that. Yeah, so it, it, uh, it, it, I think they, somebody's taken a portion of this video and then just zoomed in on Buzz Aldrin's face and the, the, the camera is fixed on Aldrin's face whilst Trump is speaking so you can hear Trump's voice in the background and, uh, and then you can see Buzz Aldrin who becomes a kind of like a... A rubber-faced alien or something. It's, it's, it's rather uncomfortable to watch yeah. actually. But I, th uh, I think it's it's probably not fair to draw too much into it because of his age. Yes, he might have a bit of Alzheimer's or something like something that. Like he is, that, he is a very old guy yeah. now. I mean, yeah. not in, not in two thousand and four when he was being interviewed by Bart Zabral. He, right. he was compass mentis then, but right. he's he is a very old guy now. Yeah. So we'll give him the benefit of the doubt on that one. Although it is very weird to watch. Um, now, is, you've got some more moon evidence you wanted to... Well, there's just a few things about. I think that are probably worth adding, which have, again, more recent ones that have come up. The first one is this clip of uh, Don Pettit, uh, who's this NASA astronaut, who basically will play the clip. It's very, very short. And this was released in an IB Times video, which I think was a collation of um, little um, sound bites from people that work at ESA, the European Space Agency, and a few other people, uh, one of whom was this Don Pettit character who says that they've destroyed the technology that took them to the moon. Well, let's have a look at that then. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. 
Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. They just chucked it in the skip then? Or? Well, you know, apparently maybe they had a ritual burning once, uh, you know... Uh, 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 along Mitchell, with all the drawings? Uh, all uh, the drawings and the tapes and everything. Once Edgar Mitchell had uh, come back from... Uh, oh, not Edgar Mitchell, he wasn't the last one, but from the last 1972 hmm. Apollo uh, 17 had finished, you know. Right. And you wanted to mention... Was it Apollo 17 where there's an astronaut gets out halfway back to the Earth? Yes, there's this, this clip that Neil sent me, Neil Geddes Ward sent me about a year or so ago, maybe longer. Very interesting clip where the story goes that on the way back from uh, the moon, um, Apollo 17, there was a, they needed to retrieve something from outside the command module. So one of them, and there's a video of this in the NASA archives, gets out, puts his, you know, the, the spacesuit is on and they go out of the capsule and uh, onto the craft to retrieve some tapes or something, some uh, you know seismic tapes from an instrument or something. I don't know why they need to be retrieved from outside the craft, but that's the story that you, you get if you read the uh, journal, because they have a log of all the missions and every minute of the mission is logged in the uh, mm -hmm. Apollo archives. And it appears that what must have happened is that uh, three of the astronauts must have needed to have gotten their suits on for the other one to go outside. Right, so, so, this, so he's supposed to have climbed out of the command module. Right. This is this tiny little module that the three astronauts the sort of conical shape are in. Yes. So the door, they're halfway back to the Earth, and that door's been opened. Yes. I mean, that's my understanding of the system, and they've actually jettisoned the, uh, the lunar, lunar module, the LEM, the lunar excursion, they've jettisoned that by that point, so I believe I checked that. So they've just got this very, very tiny space. Right, so, so there's a connection between the outside space and the space in the craft that they're yes. travelling in. Yes, so that's is all... It, is that it, was it not always an airlock seal between, you know, this, the place that they go into another, like a buffer? Not, not in the sense not. where there's not a large airlock that one of them could get into. There may be a small airlock right. at the top that, you know, you could fit a small amount of... Uh, air in, but it's certainly not one that a person right. could get inside. So, the, so if, if, if one of them was to get out into the space, um, obviously they need to all put their spacesuits on, depressurize the cabin, Correct. and, and pressurize their spacesuits, so they're all sat there in the tiny craft with their whole spacesuits yes. on. Yes, and what, the one that goes outside has to put his backpack on. Maybe the others inside didn't need to do that because they were, connect, you know, attached to some other air but, supply or and, something. And then but. they've all got their spacesuits on because they can't open the door if one of them hasn't got their spacesuit on. So they open the door with their these really difficult to, to gloves. gloves. So they've got yeah. to open. Yes, yes. Go through the rigmarole of opening the door and climbing out while the others sit there. And you think that to get a spacesuit on, you you actually need an off. You need help. From a third I party. think so. I mean, again, we've got this video of James Burke, which we're going to show, dressing himself up in one of the suits or undressing himself, and he has two people helping him, and it's not a confined space. So, you know, my question is, how would this have been possible to actually do this? And, uh, you know, you can go and watch the uh, video of the spacewalk and the video of James Burke, um, you know, doing the uh, spacesuit undress. So well, the question arises then, OK, let's say the mission's hoaxed. Why would they bother saying that one of them climbed out halfway back to get some tapes. What, well, why would they bother I, doing that? I, 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 can, I can only imagine it was to add interest to the coverage, you know, because people were a bit bored of these taxi journeys to the moon and back. You know, OK, I've just been to the shops in my taxi. What's interesting about that? So they had to put some type of incident with, you know, some sort of potential risk in there to, to keep mm -hmm. the viewership uh, interested by that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, well, anyone who's got any comments, because uh, I know that, as I said at the beginning, it's a very hot potato mm. and um, there are people who will, will, will cling to the That's official right. story. You know, and we do have some good comments coming in, as we've said with the other programmes we've done. And, for example, um, somebody wrote to me fairly recently because I'd mentioned the Werner von Braun uh, description of how you'd need a, 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 a rocket which was ten times bigger than Apollo. It's in his book, Conquest of the Moon. 1953, and this chap did say, and I think rightly said that uh, it was called Carl, and he said um, the, the Van Brown's scheme for getting to the moon was different to the one that they used. You know, and they didn't land; they landed a small rocket on the moon, whereas Van Brown's scheme, they were going to land a sort of full-size rocket on the moon to get back. Mm. So he pointed out that it wasn't really fair 
to make those those statements in quite that way because it, that wasn't exactly the scenario that uh, NASA allegedly used. In the end, it was different to the scheme that Von Braun used. But, you know, he, he still, this chap Carl, he said he still, he still thought that they did hoax it. You know, he didn't, he didn't believe that uh, that Von Braun thing was, uh, you know, the, yeah. the, the proof that they did go kind of thing, you know. And just to mention that the audience is the most important part of this planet because the information that I've had that I've been able to present most of it comes from people who contact me. Yeah, so, and you know, and if we get things wrong, and I get things wrong, I, I prefer to be corrected so I can improve what I've got. Uh, you know, and, the, and as I've said, I'm a tutor for the for the OU, so I have to work with students to help them improve work. And you know, they sometimes point out my errors if I've marked them down yeah. for something, and including the blue fleece. Yes, indeed. You know, so <laughs> so I've 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 got I've got to correct that one in some way. So, right. all right then, Andrew. Thanks very much again. And uh, remember, believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. I'm Richard D. Hall. Good night. <laughs>